So in the beginning, obviously, it's just a base, a base coat. And in this case, just, just grab one. In this case, all it is is Tamiya XF59. Any sort of light brown, yellow brown, um, yellowish colour. I have tried a yellow and it does work quite well, but it depends on what you finish it off with. The next, the next step is drawing, in this case, I airbrushed. Once again, have a look. SMS, clear red, you can use clear red, clear orange, clear yellow, clear brown, clear black, whatever you want, whatever your preference is. And that gives you a second layer. So if you, if you want to come up and actually pick up some of these crops and that, by all means do so, um, because you're going to get the paint one. All right? So you do your base coat. You can use things like these, which which I don't use, but, but I have tested them and they work, they work quite well. And this is the sort of result you get from those. That's using clear red. But I actually prefer to use good old fine pen. And it's just a simple case of grabbing your mask and most importantly masking off the area around it because you're doing a panel essentially so each panel needs to be done one at a time or, or on various spots over the surface but not next to each other you'll run into real trouble and it's just a simple case of drawing your lines and then smudging it and that's what happens when you play with them Um, it's a 0.05. You can go finer, you can go bigger. It, it makes no real difference. There's no wrong way and right way of doing this because this is just your base. So if you have a look on the camel, you'll see some streaky lines through the timber. Remembering that the, the timbers that are used on panels are a veneer. They're not a not a solid timber. They are veneers, like like shipbuilding veneers. So if you've ever seen ship timber veneer, and it yeah, plywood um it's cut and it's 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 cut down the length of the log which means on the edges you're going to have really fine lines and in the center where it comes across the arch you're going to have really fat lines from the grain okay it is never ever cut this way passing around that is a stump end so if you're looking down at the top of a stump it, it's cross cut so you won't find a veneer with a cross cut on it because they're laminated surfaces like carbon fiber or fiberglass. So they laminate, they glue them together. So you'll get all different shapes. The grain will, when they put panels on, it will be north, south, or east, west. It won't be 45. Right? That's just a manufacturing thing. It's north, south, east, west. However, they put it on, but it won't be at 45 degrees in any way, rotation. So basically, you just paint the base coat. You tinker with whether you want to use pencils, and I've used just a normal 2B pencil, um, charcoal pencils, and, um, and believe it or not, $2 textures from the $2 shop. You know, it, it works. Whatever floats your boat, it, it's how you do it. It's just a matter of smudging it, working your grain out, making sure that it looks small. If it's clunky or large, then it's not going to fit. But unless you're doing a large scale piece of timber, it's not going to fit. Um, the other issue, the other issue, biggest issue that we have with it is for the piece that's being passed around, the larger piece, you'll see that the grain is on a circular, has a circular thing on it. When you apply the oil to go over the top of that grain, you've got to follow the grain. So when you're applying it with a thick brush like this, you, you, you do it in the hoop, right? Um, and then I usually fold a little bit of a tea towel on my finger and just wipe it wipe it off and then I layer it again slowly again after that so sometimes you can have two or three layers on it sometimes you only have one these props are just one single layer of burnt sienna there it is artist oil three days so so whenever I'm building uh, especially World War one aircraft the first thing I do is I take all the wooden components off and I paint them 
very first thing. And I can set them aside for three days while I'm working on the engine or you know, whatever else I'm fiddling with, basically. I usually build two models side by side. So I'll be working on one sort of a step ahead, just just for ease. So by all means, grab a, grab a prop. For those that want to have a crack at this, I'll put some oil paint out. Blind as a bat. So this is just done with a, you can use the pen in this? No, that's just done straight out of, I'll show you right now. It's, it's basically, grab your paintbrush. And now I always melt a sprue into the back of my prop, right? That's just a habit I have. Works with wing nut wings kits. Doesn't work with rodent kits, all right? So you just put a little bit of oil on the brush and you literally brush it in. Well, yeah, it is. So if you hand that round, and I haven't done anything other than just run the run the rough brush over it. Remember, it's an oil paint, so don't get it on you. Don't get it on yourself. There are some rags here. If you do it on your fingers. There's paint brushes. If anyone wants to have a, have a crack at it, there's props there ready to go. So you didn't do any lines on those? No. You, but if, once you see it around, you'll actually see yeah. those lines come up. Oh, that just, uh, That's just yeah. they all the They're all the same. Yeah. Just. Grab a little piece. There you go. Yep. Have a crack. And then you put that excess fifty nine in home. So it's just like very light, is it? What about seventy seconds? One seventy seconds. So I take the same approach. I wouldn't be as heavy with the brush, the sharp, the blunt brush. Because, yeah, with the oil brush because the grain is going to be exponentially finer. So you should be able to see the grain clearly show through on the blank. Right, now there's also these blanks you can use, guys. Get a pencil, get a pen, draw lines on it, smudge it, and just have a look at how it works. So what you want to do is when you once you've applied it, once you've actually applied it, and you've got your your ink or your or your um, oil on it, you take it from the centre hub out in one movement. That gives you your streaks. If you stop halfway up, and 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 I've got some errors here which I've marked. Okay, if you stop halfway up, then your grain you, it stops. Your grain stops too, which and that doesn't happen in natural timber. Right, and remember these props are solid chunks of wood. Now some of them are laminated, so you the German ones, you'll see them laminated um, brown, white, brown, white, brown, white. Um, there's a good photograph of a Fokker E2, which has a laminated Garuda prop, and it's all one colour. Right? It, it is actually white, brown, white, brown, white, brown, white, but the, the um, varnish they place over the timber to seal it, stains the timber under the white timber dark brown so you will actually find german props which are all one color they're not all laminated props or as in alternating laminated props okay proceed it'll take a little bit longer to dry but other than that no that's all right you've got nice grain in it you can see the grain which is what you want you've got to do it top and bottom yeah yeah and then and then you've got to set it aside and, and the key to getting it to look good is when you seal it. I use a polyurethane, Humbrol, Humbrol polyurethane. I have used SMS clear coat. Yep, I, yeah, I've, I've never managed to even find future. Anyway, so, yep. Yeah, and gloss, did you use gloss? Yes, gloss. Yep, gloss. Pardon? Matt along the bleeding edge, most of these props, remember, they don't last very long in service. A lot of these props get snapped almost, you know, they get snapped regularly. So, and they're protected, they are protected. Um, there, are, there are older props you see, you know, you buy a second hand or you see in the second hand shop and they're this really dull, dark, dull colour. 
that's aging from 50, 60 years of just sitting in a thing. But as a general rule, they protect them the same as they dope the aircraft, they dope the props or varnish, varnish seal the props. Okay. Yeah, I'd probably make it a little bit thinner, so just okay. there's, a, there's a cheap way of doing it. Put your finger inside one of that and just run it down the blade. Okay. And that'll take too much of the excess off, but it also gives you that fine grain ah, okay. behind it. You see what I mean? Where it, the, gr the, the grain sort of appears out on the. You wash out. Yep. You wash out tomorrow afternoon, so she's down a tea towel. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so this one here is a this prop I did, yeah. and I was working on it, and I hadn't let the paint dry properly. So if you have a look at that, you'll see a, a touch mark on it. Right. This was a base coat failure. I didn't put the base coat on thick enough. And you'll see that there's a there's a patch of the, of the overcoat of the oil where it clearly shows through that the colour underneath is wasn't good enough. And, yep. You can do it. Yes, you can. But, but yep, yep. But you can also buy. One of these is actually a truck bed. It's it's actually timber strips, uh, rail rail bed stuff. I think it is, but that works just as effectively. So if you want to really cheat, just cut the bed out, put some actual timber in there. So uh, this is this is a procedural one as well, and I, and I bring this up. This one's important. I did this deliberately on the screw. What you can't. Do it on the sprue for obvious reasons. You get the paint all around it, but when you cut it off, you've got two bald patches, and you can't blend it back into the into the prop proper. So you're saying should rub rubber cloth? Yep, yeah, rubber cloth over the rubber cloth over that. Jump in, guys. Grab a blank and and have an actual crack at it. Oh, it, it, it does. The, the other way you can do it, there's, there is another way of doing it. This is how I first started off doing it, and that was just literally dabbing the cloth in and then rubbing the cloth on it. Yep. So that, that, if you have a look, gives you a much finer texture and grain and a lighter, and a lighter colour as well. Okay. So there's blanks there. Can't make a mistake. Well, try it. Test it. Actually, do it. It's the only way to learn. And this is just me experimenting at home, trying to work out the best way I could get timber done. And I'm sure if you go on YouTube, there'll be a million other versions of how to do it. Um, this is just Artisol. Just Artisol. Stock, stock Artisol. Cost you two bucks a tube or something like that. Yep. You know, you don't have to get the expensive stuff. Yep. So that. So you just airbrush that on for the. No, I hand brush it on. Okay. Yeah, I hand, when I'm doing wood grain, even my undercoat, I hand brush on. I don't airbrush it. That makes sense. No? Because it gives you some texture. It gives you some texture to work on top of it. Yeah, I texture. And also remember that if you're using an acrylic base, you can put oil on it, but you can't put oil on an uh, acrylic on an oil. So so remember that. So I use an acrylic base and put my oil over it. You can draw lines on it you can do whatever you like but and then put the oil over it but you can't put oil and then acrylic it, it won't it won't set it won't dry and even though the, the acrylic will dry on the surface you touch it it'll just slough off okay so just just something to be aware of no, but if that, you can't put too much on there. That's a rodent prop. I can tell you that straight away because it's got two thumping great holes in it. In the side. So all, all you do is just brush it off lightly, just like that. And you can see the difference between one side of the prop and the other. Does the normal tea towel doesn't matter? Doesn't I use I get these rougher tea towels, yep. uh, much to my wife's vast disgust, and I cut them up. Yeah. Um, they're, they're the better ones. Don't get the um, tea towels. That's what she said. Uh, <laughs> where? Um, 
if I ask for a tea towel, she's going to know something. Don't get don't get these these type of ones which have got the really smooth shiny surface on them. Get a get the just the rough cotton cotton ones. That I find are the best ones to yeah find find the best ones to have have a use of. Do you clean the brushes from your oil paint? Just in terms. Yep. I bought my my wife went out and bought those brushes, so they're disposable. I think they're all going in the bin. But they do the job. But they do the job. That's exactly right. I just don't need that many. It does look like a like a season flow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's just a matter of experimenting. It's hands on and it's just doing it. Be patient. Like I said, um, there are there are tutorials, are tutorials on YouTube which talk about putting on um, the layered the layered effect. And one of the biggest problems I have with the stuff I see when they do the layers is they, they draw their line and they put this big curve in it. Right? And then they draw the line, next line underneath it, and they put a big curve in that as well. When you actually look at a prop side on, they're dead flat lines. When you look at it head on, they're still dead flat lines, but the only curve they'll have will be on the edge. So when you see a massive curve going through the middle of the prop, it's physically impossible for it to be laminated that way and for it to look that way. So, so you've just got to think about how timber works and, and which way grain goes because because that is everything to when you're applying timber. And look, the albatross that's down there on the far, on the on the bench down there, that's all hand-painted timber. It's, it's not the decals. Uh, the other thing you can do to it is, is you can smudge it like I did on my botched one, like this one, and then you can lay another coat over it. And what that will do is after that coat dries, it will give you a depth perception, but a deeper colour timber as well. Right. So on, on the albatross, I did some yellows on there and, and, and a patch on one panel so that when I varnished over it or when I applied the oil over it, it came up with a distinctive two-tone on it. And then I put another layer over that as well, just just to give it some depth. But, you didn't vary the shade and that's the second coat? Nope, same just one shame one again because the variation happens on what you apply underneath it. Right? So you can you can just that's, that's right. So you can just apply the artist's oil in one even coat and it will look fine. When you put the varnish on it, um, whatever varnish it is you choose to use, that will fill in the grooves right? and will make it nice and smooth and nice and shiny. There we go, this SE5 prop. Right. So, and that's just simple, simple technique. The only other problem that you have when you're applying wood to a prop is you've got to worry about, especially the German ones, the internal hub. Where you see the circles on the hub, they're actually see-through, punched through on the plate. So there is timber underneath them. You see a lot of these guys with these nice aluminium, burnished aluminium hubs. And they're all aluminium, but there's actual spots of timber all the way through it. And so it's just about paying attention to detail. Questions, queries? So the hub of that, yep. what would you paint that on? I'd paint that gunmetal. Okay, and what would go over an oil paint? Another oil paint. So, Another I'd, oil paint. I'd, so I'd use a Humbrol oil paint. Oh, um, okay. You know, any of those sort of oil paints that, that I can apply. But if you have a look carefully, you can see the circles. Yep. Each one of those circles is actually timber yeah. underneath. Okay. So you've got to follow that. So you just do the top bit, the cap, the timber. The timber. Yep. And, and when you varnish it up, the, those, those little circles of timber that show through on the hub, and we're talking specifically German hubs here, it looks, it looks quite nice. A lot of the British hubs have a central screw. So it's a solid plate with a central screw that goes over the top of it. So they don't have the whole plates. So you need to actually pay attention and actually look at the plate when, before you even apply your artist oils because you want to know whether you want to fill all those gaps in or you, or you want to leave them unpainted. How do you do your uh, laminated? I don't think it was laminated <laughs> props. Um, I have actually done laminated props. It, it's, it's essentially the same thing. When you do your base coat, you get a mask, usually the one millimetre wide or 0.75 millimetre wide mask. You run it from the centre of your blade to the centre of the tip. And that will give you 
that laminates position. And then off that one, you lay another strip and another strip and another strip. You work your way down. You've done one base coat of, say, of this, which is slightly darker, and then you use a light colour, light yellow, like a light, a light yellow to, to look at look like the pine. And then once and you peel off the alternate layers, you apply that light yellow, let it dry, then you peel it all off, and then you just go straight over the top of it with the argus oil. Once again, one clean, one clean movement, you'll get light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. I don't. I don't tend to use it. Um, I have I have issues with accuracy of it, to be honest. To be honest with you, um, blades are curved, and straight lines on curves don't don't look right. Just as much as big big curves on straight lines don't look right. So on what should be essentially a straight line. Um, and once again, there's lots of German aircraft that flew out there with single coloured props. You can go through the photographs of all these aircraft and they are single coloured. And a lot of that comes from the from the, the varnishing they're putting on it. The German varnish or dope, which they applied on their wings, is brown. So you get these lovely five coloured lozenges that are bright and colourful, but when they go to the squadron and they dope them, it, it washes them out. Yeah, it, it washes them out. So even when they paint the aircraft green, they still doped over the top of the over the paint. So it seals it, which is why when you see the, the paint peeling off, you see the clear dope in and underneath and just chunks of paint. Big areas of where it's just peeled off. I have no I have no idea. We've seen them with you know the, they look like we yep. see the colours. But are, were they laminates of different Two different well, tippers. Two different tippers. Yeah. So, so, so they should, so, they should be yeah. tippers. But, but the, once again, I go back to the photograph of the Fokker E2, which has got an early Garuda prop. And and that clearly is a laminate prop. But it's had that coating put on it that it's all one colour. It's not until you actually look closely at the photo, you can slightly delineate each laminate as different colours. But, uh, but up close, I mean, you'd need to be this far away from it to, to actually know that it was five, five or six lanterns thick. Certain building is with work where sometimes it's mates with knots, and exactly like you said, they're all laminates. They're all laminated. It just depends whether they're laminated with different timber or some of them are the same timber, lots and lots of laminates together. And it all goes into a press to squeeze it all up and then they carve it up. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I made a ship for someone, carved it out of timber, and I laminated the props. Um, and I, the reason I laminated the props is because it gave me a perfect guide on the shape of the prop. As long as, it, as long as I had the shape right on each blade, you could tell by the way the, the laminates go. So, so, the same on that, that's right. So, so there, is, there is a reason why they do it, is because they're constantly. They did it by eye. There wasn't any machining, there wasn't any tooling. They laid it out, put it in their blank, and then they hand carved the blade. So they use an ADSI type, an ADSI, um, all types, all the way to, 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 to pull it back. Sorry, ADSI is for a boat. So I have a practice on the one. Yeah. So, any questions? Um, no, I'm I hand finished that as well. Once, once, once again, it just gives grain, gives definition. Um, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, if you airbrush, it would make no difference, it's because ultimately, all you want is the contrast between the tiny little fine lines of your colour. If you've got that contrast, you're going to look like you've got wood grain. If you don't have the contrast, then it just looks like brown. And that's just like any normal modelling varnish. Yep. Yep. So whatever whatever varnish you like. I mean, you can use it. You could. I wouldn't use flat because it's very very rare that these props were flat in colour. I, if if you're going to go, if you, I would err more on the semi gloss, so the worn sort of look. Um, and you don't. The only the only mess you would have on the edge of these props would be things like. Um, bug strikes and, and and maybe oil flying from the aircraft in front of them, but none no oil is going to get out of the cowling onto the prop that way. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So when you see all these cowlings with nice big oil 
streaks open, it's not going to happen. The airflow is pushing it back, so it's going to leak out the back edge of the cowling, not the front edge of the cowling. So it's you know it's, it's just common sense stuff. Does anyone want to ever go up flat panels? You go for your lot. Is it one of these? Yep. Can you use one of those or a, or a brush? No, I'll just try this technique. I thought you do it, but I, oh, has it been used? Yep. Yeah. Then just take a bit off that. No, nope. I do those usually with a pair of tweezers. There's some struts. The, the, the one with the black ends is the aileron strut from an RE8. This one is the interplane strut from an RE8. That's an interplane strut from a camel. Undercarriage from an RE8. Back deck of a sock with trident. So inside, still timber. And, and you'd varnish it, but in this case, this is just a blank because I've, I've already made the, the tripe and it's got two choice decks, like all wing nut wings kits. Yeah, 59 angle choices. Yeah. Well, I, I undercoat them first by hand, and, then, yeah. and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm as, I'm as lazy as hell. I, I will tend to just wipe one in, like the cloth of white, then I'll put the tweezer or the clip on the other end and finish it, and then go on stroke. So I put the first layer in while I'm holding it in the hand, gives me a good even coat, I've got an idea of how much pressure it needs, and, and how much pressure you put on it is what gives you the depth of your groove, which is why it's different between painting with a brush and using a piece of cloth. So you just use everything. Yeah. Well, sometimes I do yeah. if I want a really, really fine yellow color, because the, when you apply it with a cloth, you're applying a much thinner layer. When you're applying it with a brush, you're putting on a thicker layer. So I tend to put a thicker layer on and then wipe it off with a cloth, which then gives me my even, more even. Is there a bit? Is that the right brush? Yeah, yeah. They're all the brushes are. Just I don't want to, well, I'm trying to use a used one, but no, nah, they're all going in the bin. <laughs> So if you if you want to try, go for it, guys. You can't learn unless you have a crack at it. Yeah, and and once again, I'd say the curves on the laminate too big. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's just me picking on them. <laughs> I mean, it looks beautiful. It looks nice, and it looks even, and, and it's well spaced, and it presents well. But if I'm going to be accurate about it, you go and look at a. Prop, a laminated prop front on, and they're straight lines until they hit the edge of the blade. So, you know, they didn't use massive paddle blades. That's an SE5 blade, but that's a late war blade compared to, say, I think that's a Neem blade, Neem blade. Oh. So, so, this is a, yep. Yeah. I think that's a DH2. No, it might be a W14 actually. Uh, 24, sorry. And so this this is like an early Garuda type blade, a German Garuda type blade, um, or or uh, very similar to the Softwood Camel blade. What about those the the metal edges there? Brass. Yep, usually brass, um, but I do the oil first. No, I tend to seal it. I seal it after the brass is in because the brass is glossy as well. So you know, the glass is it, it's polished brass. Yeah. And anything like that, like the brass and the hubs as well. Yeah, like adding the hubs. And the yep. brass would be a, yeah, what is the Humbrol oils? Yeah, I use the Humbrol oil okay. because I'm putting oil on oil and it stops it from being, uh, it's no mix up with the paint, it's just clean. I actually don't mask anything. I just I just put my goggles on and do it with a really fine, really, really fine, um, <laughs> really fine paint. That's a rodent prop, you can see the big dents in the side of it. Oh dear. So, yeah. so. Yeah, wing nut wings, wing nut wings prop. Same, same type of prop. 
I can't quite tell from that angle, but pretty similar, I'd say. This sort of looks like an SE5A with the... Uh, uh, the, the, only, the only new growth... You see what you mean with the dinks. <laughs> yeah. That, that would probably be Albatross, one of the Albatross oh, okay. because that comes from that rodent kit that I built down there on the table. Ah, yes. Any other questions? Nice job. I can see what you mean by the holes in the hub. Yeah. And how do you simulate that? You, you do ground you first, you then do, you do, do the your wood first, and then you do your, the centre. Including the centre. And then you do your metal. Yeah. So the only time I don't do the centre hub, wood, is if I know that it's like British, one of the British hubs where it's just a single bolt through the hollow. Through the hollow. So, so, and that's all metal. Or you PE, just file it off and then uh, stick off PE. Yeah, no, I, these are Wing Nut Wings kits blades where I've shaved the. Yep. I actually got a, those um, little trumpeter saws. Oh, yes. And I just hit it off. I actually got them off perfectly, the hubs. So, I've actually got blank hubs. And you, you've got a PE you have to put on? No, no, the idea, the idea of oh, that. Oh, I see. The idea of that was to put it on a like a wall, like oh, yes. a stair, yeah. leaning leaning up against the wall, which is and you holes. Yeah, and I, I, what I did was I cut the bolts off, the actual heads of the bolts off. When you cut them off, it comes up a light grey, and then I just drilled through the where the bolt, and I shaved it off. So yeah, I got both sides of the bolt holes and the, the green The um, pump oil is going to be toy wheel. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Um, you, you can get um, upstairs in Belconnen. There's an art. There's an art store. That Acres Lease. Yeah, they sell Helmbrough planks in there as well. Because I was going to go to the one bread and yeah. So, so you know, you can pick this. They are hard. They are hard to find. So, you, you grab them when you see them. You grab them. Shipping. Oh, they're going to. They're going. Humbrough's going to the Quillock. They'll be going away from the East. Well, that's what I heard, so who knows whether that's true. Stay too boxed from the office and duck in at lunchtime. So, no problems with that? Any any questions? Does anyone want to know how to make turnbuckles while we're here? Yes. I bought all my turnbuckle stuff. So, for those that don't make World War One aircraft, turnbuckles are sort of redundant um, but some World War II aircraft and interwar aircraft use turnbuckles. So now sop width, you'll notice there's no turnbuckles on the sop width in any way shape manner or form. That's because sop width didn't use turnbuckles. They had used RFC flat wire and it was a clip in at each end. So it had, it had a V peak thing, it had a bore on, clipped in at each end. A lot of, a lot of effort all right, so there was no tension. It was literal manual. Give it a give it a pull. Um, on on that raft flat wire, from from my research, is eight millimeters wide, two millimeters thick. Okay, so it's it's thicker at the ends where it ball ball joints in, but the flat wire itself is two millimeters thick, eight millimeters wide. From 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 the research I did. In saying that, there may be different types of flat wire out there. Bigger aircraft may use wider flat wire or thicker flat wire. I don't know. I can't find anything definitive on it. Um, but I say that because you see a lot of these wing nut wings kits made with that grey silver flat wire tape, right? If you divide that by 32, this scale, they should only be 0.3 millimetre. Now, I bought some of it, and it's 0.6 of a millimetre wide, which is twice as wide as what it should be. Yeah, yeah. So, so it will, it will even the, the, the line stuff you buy on the easy line, easy line flat one, it's too wide. It's double the size of what it needs to be. Now, I always get told, but you didn't use flat wire. Well, if I measure that wire that's on there, that's probably closer to being the proper flat wire than... What's that standard? That's just standard. Fine, yep, fine, easy line. Okay, so just a cautionary thing. I mean, it looks really good. The flat wire looks really good. I've seen photo etch. I've seen people flatten copper. There's, there's lots of ways of doing it. But let's get the turnbuckles. I used to make sailing ships, so I got lots of different coloured laminated timbers. 
that I could glue together. And the reason I laminated the timber to do it was so I could give give myself a guideline when I cut a groove in it. So all I did was I cut a groove in it to a point, to a flat point on the bottom. You can see a line across there, which I also cut. Cut a groove. That's the first thing you have to do. Build that. I use I use 0.5 millimeter brass. Well, I brought the wrong one by the looks of. Hollow. I've got, I've got corner angle in here and everything. Sorry. So it's basically 0.5 millimeter brass rod, which is hollow. I think it's a 0.3 millimeter circle through the um, hole through the middle of it. The next, the next thing you need to do is you need to make what you're going to put in it. Excuse me, it's the only way I can get it out. If you have a look at those, if you have a look at those little pieces of copper wire, <laughs> right? They've got a circle hoop through the end of them. Thank you. So they've actually got a circle through the end of it. What you do is you get your brass rod. You insert it into your groove, like so. Right. Insert it, insert it into the groove. You get your scalpel. I usually turn it around the other way because I'm as clumsy as hell. Right. Which means I can put I can put my weight finger and the weight on it. And I just measure it, so I've measured it 3 mil, 5 mil, 4 mil, whatever length I want. And I'm finding 3 mil is better than 5 mil, even though it does measure to 5 mil. It, it looks clunky and wrong to me. Okay, so I, I go smaller and finer, and it seems to look better. And then all you do is just spin it. And I'm just spinning the rod and letting the blade go over the top of it. Right. Do that a couple of times. Sorry, didn't organise myself for this one. Pair of pliers. Break it off. Now I've got one out of part of my turn buckle. Ideal. Put it there. Now comes the next bit, which is the most fun, meaning the most tedious in this case. I just got a piece of balsa wood, then a piece of really fine wire into a hook. Right? Two dollar shot. You know the bubble guns the kids use? I think it's two or five bucks for a pack of two guns. They got these little electric motors in them. Of course I have to. And what do these lovely little electric motors have in them? Really fine copper wire. Right? Which you, which you can take off. But my, my big cheat at the moment is this, which comes out of the center of a computer hard drive, an old one. Uh, just need to get a loose piece of wire here. There you go, it's, it's sprung. I literally just get a piece, fold it over my finger, so I've got a hoop, grab my extremely technical tool, well, there you go. Did you just fold it over? Did you just fold it over in two parts? Yep, fold it over in two parts. <coughs> and there you go. Now I've got my sense core. And then get the uh, bit and twist it. Yep, all you do is twist it. And, and you'll, find if you, you'll find if you twist it too tight, what will happen is it will snap like any metal that gets heated over time. It'll, it'll break. So there you go. I've got an eyelet. Once again, I've got to use Sorry. And I'd normally have my goggles on to do this because I'm as blind as a bat. There, you have a turnbuckle. Right. Right. 
and this is the better than say the game in late so it wasn't just want to pay 30 50 bucks for something which you get like a hundred bucks yeah, look, no, no, I'm just, I'm just looking at the amount of effort that plus I'm getting to think well, on the other side. Might, you yeah. must have a big Mac, not a big Mac. I don't know how you do your fingers. Like, you don't have to have too many pairs of buddies and tweezers. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking. It's just it's just the skill it takes to do that. That's it, the problem is there is no real skill to it. Okay. What, no, what, no, no. What, what, what it is is this, this, this bit. Well, yeah, dexterous, I suppose. This bit's pretty straightforward. It's just, it's just literally put it over your hook yeah, no, and, and you only cut your length. You, you, you'd waste a lot of this, I'll be perfectly honest with you, because when you do the loop, right, most of that is in the tail and you're going to throw it out. So yes. what I do is when I'm sitting at home with the TV on or whatever and I've got nothing to do, I will just sit there, toil my knees up, put them in a little container like this and I make a whole bundle. I make, I'm not joking, bundles of them. So these are all four, five mil, two, three mil, uh, open-ended ones, which I use for the base for when I'm in the in, in the. Doing. No camels. Camels have no turnbuckles on them anywhere. Yep. So so these ones. Sorry for that. These ones are looped at both ends. They don't have a tail on them. I've actually put a, a, a ring in each, in each end. Right, so they can be used as a centerpiece or an attachment to another buckle or an extension. Or, you know, when you see, sometimes you see the turn buckle in the middle, instead of it being up against the frame or the, or the fuselage, it's the wire connects and then it goes to the turn buckle in the middle. So that's my middle turn buckle. Now, the other thing I've started doing with these, I must admit, is I really don't want that circle right so what i've been doing is i get my pliers and i close it into an oblong and the reason i do that is when i tie my line to it the line goes straight to the end of the oblong whereas on the circle it will rotate around either side of the do you understand what i mean and, it's more accurate. and, 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 and that's right it's more accurate. so that's just a trick that i use and yes it takes time and if you look at something like a that albatross down there, there's seven, seven, seven rigging lines per side, which means you'll need four 28 turn buttons just on the wings, top and bottom, not including if you want to add a, a, a lengthening one, which is like the, the two hoop one, or one which is a double buckle, so that it's got a connection. And I make those double buckles as well. So it's, it's uh, copper wire through, Hoop attached to another one with a hoop out the other end, okay, and then that ties on to the line. So, but you only need that at one end because you only adjust a turnbuckle at one end, you don't need to adjust it at both ends. So, you only need a single at one end, and it's usually the upper wing. If you look at the photographs of the German aircraft, you see that single attachment point at the top and a double at the bottom. So, there's a double turn the turnbuckle at the bottom. So it's just a matter of looking at photographs. Yeah. So, questions on that? Yeah. Nothing? All good? Yeah. It's all right. In terms of cloth with your oil, do you use a particular type of cloth? Or is it just a washer that's cut up? I, I prefer these, these. I mean, you can take that with you. Sort of like a washer, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, that's right. It's rougher, it's a tea towel, but it's one of the old cotton, really old cotton sort of tea towels. One of the things I will tell you though is when you cut these, right? When you cut these, they get threads and that and they're hanging off the bottom. So make sure you shake them out pretty good, make sure you get the fluff off them before you start working on your even using the paintbrush, it's the paintbrush that's stuck in the yep, in the hook of you got to. Yep, work, you've, work out the, uh, yep, you've got to work it out, which is why I usually use a brush first and a cloth um, second, because the cloth takes all the shit out of it as, as it goes along. But there's plenty of blanks there to try, guys. I'm really disappointed no one's having a crack at the blank. 
Why don't you give another demo? Because I think I, I was talking earlier. I just oh, I can, I can show you. One blade. One blade? I missed the two. So just do the same thing. So you, yeah, you, just, you so use this as your base. Use, I use this as my base. Which is a Tamiya XF fifty fifty nine. There's a yellow. A yellow sand. Any of those light. These ones I think are slightly dark. And you can see I've pre-grained this one already. So this will be a third coat. I was mucking around with technique, and I did a I did a really light yellow, and then I did a dark yellow. And that one has a, a bit wavy. Yes, now that that was just me mucking around with it. Right. So what are you going to do for a third coat? You going to... I'm going to use an oil on the third coat. Oh, what? Sorry, what's on the first coat then? First coat's this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Second, second coat, coat is, is this mask with a bit of black in it. Oh, okay. To make yeah, it dark. Yeah, yeah sure. acrylic. To make it darker, so it's acrylic on acrylic. Got it. And then. Oh, you, okay, so you did do four or five. So right. this is the this is the only ones I've done three coats in. All these yeah, others I've done in two number of strokes. Oh yeah, yeah. When that, I was doing that one, yep. trying to get get it looking right, it took me about four or five strokes. So I haven't used a paintbrush on this one. I've just gone straight to the cloth. Yes. So so what I'm doing is I'm just running the straight down the blade. Yep. And that straight is out which you've done underneath. Yep. And you'll see what I've done underneath because you'll see the little curves in it. So I've taken it the bottom of the blade. I'll, I'll hold it to it. Okay, I see the curves still. Yep. But yeah, it gives it more depth. And, and if I varnish that now, it'll have even more depth and more definition on it because the varnish highlights the, the, the darks and the lights. Right. Let's chuck it on the table. Yeah. Okay. And these things inside, you know, you haven't mentioned yet. These, these cloths? Oh, these, these, these are what I used to spray on here. So this, I, I was just testing this. So this is a light brown. That one over there is a red. So having never done it this way, I've done, or not done it this way as in demonstration wise, but I've done it at home when I've just been mucking around testing it. I've got a Horton HO229 and I want to do it in wood. I'm going to paint the wood as opposed to go and buy the Ushi set for it. So this is my attempt to just put a really light grain into the plywood panelling that they used. Mind you, the Ushi panelling is beautiful. Well, it, it, it is beautiful. At least you've got dinner template as well. Yep. But in this case, I've got nice, just really fine colour underneath it. Yep. Right, so you can just see that nice tiny bit of colour underneath it yep. and the cloth gives me that grain. Now did you do that opposite the grain or with the grain? So it looks... No, no, the plastic unfortunately has got lines in it. Oh, the plastic. That's good. the plastic's lines in it. The card, oh. That's this, this is this card stuff. I just bought, bought, oh, yeah. bought a card and cut it up and unfortunately the lines in the really I, I can see the paint. Yeah, come through. When I ignore the lines on the plastic. Yeah. So ignore the lines on the plastic and just look at it as a casino. You started with that, so you used a coarse brush, did you, to give you a bit of texture? So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I would if it was a prom. In this case, I've just done, I've just done, I've just done straight out. Just a brush. Just no, just applied the oil. With the cloth. Okay. But your, your base coat, which was in acrylic? Oh, yeah, base coat, which is acrylic, yeah, just with, with a brush. With a brush. Yep. And, that, and that, yep. the brush strokes give you that slight bumpiness. Yep, yeah. Yep. yeah, it gives you the yeah, unclean yeah, surface, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is what you want. So you yeah. only developed this well. Yeah. Yeah. So the only difference of this is I airbrushed this, this red using one of these templates. Okay. Okay, and now... I was looking at these templates, what... They're quite odd looking templates. Are they designed for grain? That is designed for wood grain. So that's my yeah. first attempt with a wood grain panel yeah. using a. Oh. Yeah. So you can see. It's really convincing, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, so there's lots lots of ways of tinks it Lots of ways of. Mm. What colour were you using in the oil paints? Burnt sienna. Burnt sienna, okay. Yeah. 